universal uh, jurisdiction. Soraya Rodriguez is an MP for the Socialist uh, Party in Spain, and she is also the spokesperson in uh, the Congress for uh, this organization. So, based on what Luciano was saying, Soraya, what's the role of politicians in enforcing universal jurisdiction? Considering that back in 2009, uh, the uh, Socialist Party and the Popular Party in Spain decided to restrict this uh, so far exercise of an universal jurisdiction. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and good day to all. Before I answer your question, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, holding this debate or a seminar on universal jurisdiction and the recent reform that recently took place in our country. I was telling Judge Garzon that we have some time during this week to discuss uh, the reform, actually more time than we had to discuss it in the Congress before it was enacted. This amendment of a jurisdiction in Spain started as a bill of law or a proposal, not even a bill of law, of one political party. It was submitted on February 7th, and on March 14, it was already published in the uh, uh, state's official newsletter. There was no chance whatsoever for political debate. We could not even debate the amendments and modifications introduced by other uh, parliamentary groups. All groups in the, in the Congress opposed uh, radically to this amendment, and yet it was passed. So to answer your question on the role of politicians, well, actually, you, you may be talking about the role of governments, right? Governments need uh, or are liable of modifications uh, taking place in their own countries. And just as you said, uh, these modifications or amendments allow a country or prevent a country from exercising universal jurisdiction. Right now in Spain, we cannot exercise it. This is uh, not an amendment, actually. What took place in Spain was the removal of universal jurisdiction from Spain. And it is important to understand why. Why? Does this reform strangle our possibility to exercise universal jurisdiction? Well, we have not had the opportunity to hear the government since it was a proposal for law of one political party. No minister in the government actually uh, presented the, the project. We couldn't hear the Minister of Justice or Foreign Affairs or Economy. It seems to be that foreign affairs and economy were more interested in the matter than uh, the uh, legal side of things. So since no one in the government has explained why this reform took place, perhaps I would like to read one reply of the Minister of Justice during a session of the Senate. It's an answer to a question from one political party when the reform had already been approved in the official newsletter and when the first excarcerations of uh, uh, alleged uh, perpetrators of drug uh, traffic were being released. So perhaps this answer in the Senate can help us. Minister Gallardon was asked about the amendment on universal justice uh, recently approved in the official newsletter. He replies, we must be aware of the uselessness of notions that merely generated false expectations, but which never achieved concrete results. And let me ask you back, in 20 years of universal jurisdiction, I'm not asking you how many 
cases have been opened or how many claims have been filed. I will ask you how many indictments or convictions have taken place in Spain, Your Honor. The answer is one. And do you know why that took place? Because an Argentinian criminal calculated that his conviction in Spain, should he surrender himself, was lower than he would have in Argentina. So he voluntarily turned himself in. Not a single initiative of universal jurisdiction other than this one in fraud of law has reached a happy ending because universal jurisdiction is perfectly useless and it has served the only purpose of generating false expectations that never reached concrete results. Are we trying to be the police of the world just because we want to wear the badge? And I believe this is a very interesting statement in the light of uh, uh, our current situation. Because this reply from the Minister of Justice, therefore a reply from the government, includes the three fundamental justifications of the removal of universal jurisdiction in Spain. As clearly stated, the uh, universal jurisdiction that a court of law can exercise is seen as useless. Second, universal jurisdiction and countries exercising it become police of the world, become prosecutors of the world, and there is therefore an invasion of uh, sovereignty or uh, of uh, the principle of, of uh, sovereign decisions. And thirdly, as stated in uh, uh, the uh, whereases of the law, for universal jurisdiction, we already have international courts of law. So as explained in the whereases, it, under the very Rome statute, it is established that the exercise of universal jurisdiction is in, uh, by the international court of law is incompatible with domestic courts of law and their use of uh, universal jurisdiction. So perhaps this might lead us to understand why this amendment was done. It is clear that universal jurisdiction is not useless. I would say it's fundamental, as we have heard from all panel members so far today. I would say it's the sole way to convey a very clear message to perpetrators of different crimes that they commit in their own countries where they are covered up by their own government or where crimes affect the very international community, I would say we need to convey a clear message that impunity is geographically reduced. But once you exit that haven, so to speak, uh, somebody will come and get you you're not you're not exempt of responsibility it's like the case of pinochet when judge garzon intervened it seemed clear or well, he seemed to be above the law until this happened to him so the fact or, or the statement that universal jurisdiction that can be exercised by domestic uh, courts of law involves a breach to sovereignty is not true we're acting as nations that cooperate and aid the international community through, uh, with which we have commitments via subscription to international treaties according to which in certain crimes like torture or genocide we are all affected and only all in terms of uh, the international community can persecute and investigate and trial those crimes. Hence, States exercising universal jurisdiction are not invading or breaching the sovereignty of other countries. They're providing legal aid in the, in, within the scope of international cooperation. That's why we subscribe international treaties, which are absolutely trampled by modifications like the one we had in Spain. So, I don't know, somebody might say, well, the interpretation you do on the subsidiary subsidiarity principle is absolutely opposite. Of course, there are uh, criminal, international criminal courts, but not all countries have signed this kind of jurisdiction and thus accept their influence, not 
nor are all crimes included or uh, are part of the competence of, uh, of these uh, courts of law. Not all of these crimes are indictable. So obviously there's a, a subsidiary principle that acts exactly in the opposite way uh, that uh, the Spanish government has interpreted it. So where the court of law cannot reach, a nation has the duty of persecuting, investigating, and judging. But I would say that these three rationales are the sole explanation we have for uh, the uh, enactment of this reform in Spain. The uh, government in charge of this amendment against all parliament political forces, nobody in the parliament, not a single group ever supported this amendment. This, the government is fully aware that uh, this idea of uselessness, invasion of competencies and principle of subsidiarity and with international courts are, are not shared by anyone. The government knows that. These principles are not shared by the institutional bodies of the Spanish states that should have issued their own report. That's why no proposal was submitted. That's why it was not a bill of law, because it had, if it had been a bill of law, the government should have requested the uh, prosecution office and the Ministry of State a preceptive report. And they would have found a position to that as a matter of fact, uh, this uh, Bill of Law would have been in breach of our own Constitution. So they used uh, this path of a proposal instead of a Bill of Law. And clearly, Article 561 of the Organic Law of Legal Power states that a report is required when the competence of judges and courts of law are affected, when it affects constitutional rights. And Article 561 states that the Congress or the legislative uh, uh, board of a specific state needs to have uh, a say in that. And they did it this way because uh, they could skip the necessary report according to the Constitution. So certainly we did uh, enact uh, an amendment in 2009, which will be debated and most likely criticized in this uh, forum. But certainly, in this unlimited universal jurisdiction principle to which you referred, we uh, did establish a connection principle to that concept, which may be criticized, but at least it allowed Spain to exercise universal jurisdiction whenever uh, the victim uh, was originary from Spain and whenever the uh, perpetrator was in, in Spanish territory or wherever there was a connection between the place where the crime was committed and Spain, the, government, uh, the nation of Spain. So it, it was an open door for the exercise of universal jurisdiction. At least universal jurisdiction could be exercised in Spain in 2009, but not after this amendment. This is not an amendment of universal jurisdiction. It's its removal from uh, the Spanish legal system. We're witnessing that out on the street, the uh, release of, uh, of uh, perpetrators of drug traffic crimes is just evidence that uh, crimes committed in Spain, once uh, our juris universal jurisdiction possibilities were removed, have been left out of or are out of our reach now. And we're witnessing legal decisions that are releasing presumed uh, criminals. And uh, well, the amendment remains there. And there is an initiative by Judge Garzon for holding a seminar like this for a deeper debate on these matters. I have two things to add before I conclude. And the first one is, uh, 
concerning the removal of elements that prevent Spain, Spain from prosecuting a crime against humanity. Uh, I would like to consider the definition you made about uh, different sorts of victims. You made a classification, first, second, third class, and invisible. Among the crimes established in the European Council in 2005 on uh, domestic violence, um, human traffic, mutilation, ablation, we, are, we also have a pre-requirement that did not exist in the past, and it's uh, very serious. I'm talking about the need for a formal claim from the prosecutor's office or a legal suit. Imagine how you can detect a crime of ablation or general mutilation in Spain. How do you detect that? At the doctor's office, at school. A, a teacher, a tutor, a, a, a gym teacher. So. Establishing this requirement for legal suit or for legal claim removes every possibility to persecute these crimes that affect nearly 17,000 girls in Spain and half a million throughout the European Union without speaking of millions of women around the world. It's the clearest example I can find that the tiniest detail in the uh, persecution requirement has, uh, can change the possibility for the exercise of universal jurisdiction. And the uh, transient uh, um, explanation is a textbook example. Now that our government believes that universal jurisdiction is useless, they have taken this into uh, the cases of countries that have required a fast-track reform into closing already open cases, court cases. This explains that this new amendment states that once published in the official newsletter, all cases, all trials, all claims opened in, court, in Spanish courts of law will be dismissed and filed in Spain. So, a government decision, a decision of the executive power, states that another decision of, in the legal field is automatically established. Legal claims are opened by a legal decision, and they're closed by a legal decision. That's the way it should be. So during the very fast debate we had before this amendment, I was asking a, a retired judge with a lot of experience in our country, I asked him, have you, has it ever happened to you that the executive comes and tells you to close a case? And he looked at me and he said, well, Soraya, yes, it has happened. By government decision, I've been forced to dismiss and file many, uh, many cases when Franco was in power, not after the dictatorship, not once. And that's why I was saying that the Socialist Party in Spain is actually introducing uh, um, an inconstitutionality appeal because we're convinced that this new amendment is inconstitutional. As a matter of fact, it breaches Article 24 of our Constitution, the principle of effective legal custody to satisfy the interests of third states that were being investigated or persecuted uh, based on this principle, the government has left Spanish victims without protection. That's the Article 24 in our Constitution and Article 14 of the principle of equality before the law. Article 9 of uh, legal security and intervention of public powers. And, the, art, and clearly Article 125 of the exercise of popular action in our country and it clearly breaches Article 117 of our Constitution establishing the exclusiveness of uh, the uh, legal um, effectiveness in our country, or legal powers in our country. And this is just the beginning of the list. I'm sure Dolores or Baltazar can find other examples of articles being breached. And to close, I will say 
that beyond any mistakes that might have been made, we still have the possibility to rectify. The principle of universal jurisdiction was possible in our country, was enacted in our country up until this amendment was enacted. And it is not useless. As we heard in the, at the beginning of Anna Karenina, where the author stated that all families are similar, but unhappy families are unhappy in different ways, the truth is that all victims of uh, genocide crimes, of crimes against humanity, all victims are similar. They have the same face, the same damage to their integrity, and the same damage to their dignity. It is true that dictators and the perpetrators of torture or genocide vary in size and shape, and they breach these rights in different ways. And this is what universal jurisdiction is about. On behalf of victims that share the same face, the international community ought to be able to prosecute and trial the perpetrators of these crimes, regardless the form they have used to breach those rights. Thank you. Take more powers. Thank you, Anna. So continue with Soraya. Most questions were about the uh, aspect of inconstitutionality and the, the appeal. If your party comes to power, Will this amendment or this organic law be reformed in this aspect? It is, it, is it expected to be amended? And where would you go back to? To 1985, to 2009, would you amend the one in 2014? Well, we have actually submitted and recorded a bill of law to uh, amend the uh, current situation, which was modified by the 2014 law. We, and well, we want to take it back to the one that existed after uh, the one in 2009. So it was not part of our uh, program. We did not expect to include such important uh, amendments that affect legal rights and legal protection of Spanish citizens that are clearly unprotected today. It was not part of our program. This was not part of our electoral promises. But obviously, we uh, had not included it because we had not witnessed this amendment. We have, however, submitted a proposal to go back to the status quo before this law of 2014. Would we go back to 85? Um, well, that's a debate that remains to be held. We have witnessed what has happened after the 14 Amendment. And I would say that the limitation that existed in 2009 and the implementation of the universal jurisdiction uh, principle uh, can generate a lot of uh, pressure and issues. We're perfectly aware of that, and we're aware of the kind of pressure that led to this reform, because uh, thus uh, removing the uh, possibility for uh, universal jurisdiction. We've been through that. So establishing this principle of, of uh, cause and effect would, uh, would call for urgent debate. It is true. It was a fact that Spain could exercise the universal jurisdiction principle. So we need to establish an element of connection between what we could do in the past and what we can do now. Obviously, we're open for debate, but the most urgent thing for us is uh, to uh, go back to a, or to reverse the effect of the 2014 law. And obviously, uh, the our uh, appeal is not an appeal for uh, suspension.